In the previous segment, we saw that there were once many different species of humans on planet Earth. There are differences between these human species, but there are also similarities. They all belonged, after all, to the same genus, the genus Homo. Now, all human species, both the big ones and the small uh, Homo erectus and the Neanderthals, they all shared several defining characteristics that make them all humans. The first defining characteristic of all human species is that they all had extraordinarily large brains, uh, when you compare them to, to other animals. Mammals weighing 60 kilograms usually have a brain, uh, this, uh, the size of the brain is usually about 200 cubic centimeters. In contrast, uh, Homo sapiens weighing 60 kilos have a brain averaging between 1200 and 1400 cubic centimeters. The brain, this is Homo sapiens today, the brains of earlier humans were, were smaller, but even the brain of the earliest men and women in East Africa about two and a half million years ago, it was still very large compared, say, to the brain of a tiger of an equal weight or of a pig of an equal, equal weight. This disproportion of a very big brain compared to body size only increased as humans evolved. Now, the fact that humans evolved larger and larger and larger brains may seem to us obvious. We are so proud of our big brains that we tend to assume that when it comes to brains, more is always better. But if this was the case, then evolutionary pressures should have produced not only humans with very big brains, but also cats with big brains, and dogs with big brains, and birds with big brains, and so forth. And this did not happen. The fact is that a big brain, aside from its advantages, is also a very big problem. First of all, you have to carry it around. It doesn't help you if you have a brain and you leave it at home. So you have to carry it around with you all the time, and you have to protect it so it usually is encased within a massive uh, skull with all these bones protecting the brain. And it's hard to carry around, it's, it's burdensome to the body to carry around this big head with the big brain inside it. What is even more hard is to fuel the brain with energy. In Homo sapiens, in us, the brain accounts for about uh, two or three percent of total body weight, but it consumes 25 percent of the body's energy when the body is at rest, not running after a giraffe or something. By comparison, the brains of other apes, like chimpanzees or gorillas, they require only eight percent of, of, uh, of the energy of the body. And even apes have very, relatively very large brains. So the big problem with the brain, except, uh, aside from carrying it around, is how to fuel it with energy. Ancient humans paid for their larger and larger brains in two main ways. First of all, they had to spend more time looking for food. Whereas a baboon with a smaller brain doesn't need so much food, so it sits around in the sun doing nothing much of the day, a human with this big brain all the time has to go around looking for food to eat something so that there will be energy to fuel the brain. So this is one way that humans paid for the brain. A second method uh, for paying the energy budget of the brain is that humans became, as the brain got bigger, humans became less muscular. The muscles became smaller and weaker. This is a little like a government which uh, deflects money, which moves money from the defense budget to the education budget, so humans began to moving energy from muscles to brains, from uh, biceps to neurons. Less muscles, so the muscles don't need much energy. You can divert this energy to fuel your brains. Now, uh, this idea 
of uh, 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 giving up on muscle in order to have a bigger brain is it's far from obvious that this is a good idea, that this is a good strategy for survival in the savanna. A chimpanzee, for example, cannot win an argument with Homo sapiens, but a chimpanzee can rip apart a human being as if it was a rag doll. A chimpanzee that weighs 60 kilograms is estimated to be at least five times stronger than a human being weighing an equal weight of 60 kilograms. So this giving up on muscles in exchange for brain, it wasn't necessarily such a great idea, such a, such a good deal. Now today, this deal sounds uh, uh, very advantageous to us because our big brains really pay off. Thanks to our big brains, we have cars and we have guns, so we can drive much, much faster than a chimpanzee and we can shoot the chimpanzee from afar, so we are much more powerful. But this is only today. If you go back uh, uh, two million years ago, there is very little that human beings got from their big brains. The brains kept growing and growing, but apart from some flint knives and pointed sticks, humans had very little to show for their big brains. Uh, honestly speaking, the evolution of the human brain, why it became so big, is one of the greatest mysteries in evolution. We don't really know what drove uh, the growth of, of the human brains over hundreds of thousands of years in which it didn't seem to be doing anything special. It's very important in general in science that if you have a very important question and you don't know the answer to this question, then just be honest about it. Just say, we don't know, I don't know. So this is the case with the big brain. It's very important to know why the brain of our uh, ancestors got bigger and bigger, but we don't really have a good answer uh, to this question. So this is the first quality common to all humans, big brains. Another quality which is common to all human species, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, us, Homo floresiensis, is that all of us humans walk upright on two legs. We don't walk on all fours like most of the other mammals. Uh, it's easier to explain the advantages of walking upright than the advantages of the big brains. When you stand up, when you walk on only two legs and you stand up, it's much easier uh, to scan the savanna in, in search of prey or in search of uh, enemies and predators like uh, uh, lions and elephants. You can see them from much further away. Moreover, once your hands are freed from, from uh, uh, you don't need your hands in order to walk. You don't have to walk on all fours, you walk only on, on two legs and the hands are free. You can use your hands for many other new purposes, like signaling your friends, I'm here, or like uh, throwing stones and throwing sticks. So this is another big advantage of, of walking upright, that the hands are free. And once the hands became free from walking, humans over generation evolved an increasing concentration of nerves and finely small, finely tuned muscles in their palms and in their fingers, which enables humans to perform very complicated, very delicate tasks with their hands, like, for example, uh, producing tools and using tools, uh, stone tools and, and, and uh, sticks and, and spears and things like that. The first evidence we have for uh, uh, humans producing and using tools dates back to about two and a half million years ago uh, in East Africa. And from that, this is actually the, the first sign that we are dealing here with humans. The manufacture and use of tools is a defining characteristic by which archaeologists recognize ancient humans. So these are the big advantages of walking upright, that you can see farther away, that you can have uh, free hands, and then you can start making and using tools. However, everything in evolution comes with a cost. Nothing is for free. And walking upright also has its downside. The first problem 
with walking upright is that the skeleton of our primate ancestors evolved for millions upon millions of years to support a creature that walked on all fours and had also a relatively small head and small brain. Now, when humans moved to walking upright on just two legs, and simultaneously they had bigger brains and bigger heads, this created very big stress on the spine and on the skeleton and on the muscles in general. Because again, when you take a creature that walks on all four and suddenly the, the skeleton and the muscles have to adjust to walking just on, on two legs and to support this big weight on top of the, of the head, this creates a lot of problems. So the skeleton and the muscles, they over the generations uh, evolved to, to do it better, but it was never perfect. And even today, people still suffer a lot from back aches and from stiff necks and from all kinds of other problems in the skeleton and in the muscular system, which result from uh, moving uh, to an upright position. So this is one thing that human paid for walking upright. Women paid extra. Women had to pay something more uh, uh, for walking up upright on two legs than men did. Walking upright, one of the things that happens when you walk upright is that your hips have to be relatively narrow and close to one another. In women, this also means that the birth canal must be narrow. The birth canal is this passage through which the baby is born. And this created a huge problem because at roughly the same period, women had to give birth to babies through a narrow birth canal at the same time that the brains and the head of the babies became bigger. So how, this was a very big problem in human evolution, how to give birth to babies with big heads through a narrower and narrower birth canal. Um, this was a big problem. And one of the outcomes was that women and children began to die during childbirth more and more. Death in childbirth of both the babies and the mothers became far more common among humans than among chimpanzees or baboons or zebras or elephants. Again, because they had to, to manage these two things together at the same time to walk upright so you have a narrow birth canal and to have a big brain so the baby has a large head that has to fit through the narrow birth canal. What was the solution to this problem? So the solution to this problem was to give birth to babies earlier and earlier when they are still small and especially when their head and brains are still, are still very small and supple. Obviously, it wasn't a conscious solution. It's not like two million years ago, uh, men and women came together in a big conference, a big meeting, and scratched their head and said, OK, how do we solve this? And somebody said, let's give birth earlier, and this is what they did. Obviously, it wasn't like this. The solution was given simply by natural selection. Women that gave birth relatively late they had a greater chance of dying in childbirth, and so they had a smaller chance of, uh, uh, of their genes moving to the next generation. Women that gave birth earlier, when the child was still undeveloped, rather small, with a small head, they had a better chance of surviving and passing on their genes to the next generation. So over time, the pregnancy period of women became shorter and shorter, and women began to give birth earlier and earlier. Uh, and even today, women give birth to, to human babies much earlier, comparatively, than any other uh, animal. Humans, uh, so to speak, are born prematurely, when they are only half-baked 
like you take the, the, the cake from the oven when it is still only half baked, it's not ready yet. This is how humans emerge from the womb when many of the vital systems, especially in the brain, are still not developed or still underdeveloped. When you compare in this respect humans to other animals, you see there's a, a, a big difference. Um, a small horse, a colt, can start walking and trotting very shortly after birth. Within hours of being born, a small horse can start walking. If you have cats at home, you may know that a kitten can leave its mother and start walking around by itself, looking for food and playing with other cats when it is only a few weeks old. Human babies, on the other hand, remain helpless and completely dependent upon their elders for many months and even years. It takes years for a human baby to catch up with what uh, horses, with what baby horses and baby uh, kittens can do. Uh, so this was the solution, the evolutionary solution, how to walk upright with big heads. The solution was to give birth to babies earlier when they are underdeveloped. And this had immense uh, importance for the future of, uh, of humankind and for our societies today, due to several reasons. First of all, because human children are born prematurely, they need a lot of care and attention from, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from their elders, from their parents and siblings and, for, and so forth, in order to uh, uh, survive and grow up. In order for a human child to survive, you need to give it much more care and much more attention than in order for a kitten to, to, to survive and to grow up. Usually, a single mother cannot give to her baby enough care and attention only by herself in order that it uh, uh, survives and grows up and reaches maturity. There is a saying, a famous saying, that it takes an entire tribe to raise a human. You need help from a lot of people in order to raise your child. And this is why humans evolved very strong social ties with one another, evolutionary pressures uh, natural selection favored humans who are capable of forming strong social ties and living in tribes because this is essential for taking care of, of the babies. A grown-up can survive by himself or herself. It's not easy, but it's possible, but they won't have children. If you have children, the only way that you can take care of them until they are old is if you have assistance from other humans, and therefore humans live in tribes or in, in groups. So this is the first big impact of the fact that humans are born underdeveloped, half-baked. The second important uh, impact is that humans can be educated and humans can be socialized to a far greater extent, to a far greater degree than any other animal. Most mammals emerge from the womb of their mothers like some porcelain vase emerging from a kiln. It's ready. And if you now try to change the shape of this porcelain vase, then you will only scratch it or break it. In contrast, humans emerge from the womb of their mothers like a molten glass emerging from a furnace. It's still very liquid, some, somewhere between liquid and solid. So you can take it and you can spin it and stretch it and shape it into, into all kinds of shapes. So this is what's happening with humans. You can, after they are born, educated, you can educate them and you can socialize them in various ways. And this is why today we can educate our children to become Christians or, or, or Buddhists, uh, capitalists or socialists, uh, warlike or peace-loving. It's all because our brains, uh, we emerge from the womb with half-baked bodies and brains and we can still be, you can still play with us to a large extent. So this is the uh, another important characteristic of humans, that they can be educated and socialized more than almost any other animal. We tend to assume that having a large brain, 
being able to produce and use tools, having uh, complex uh, societies are huge advantages. And it is obvious why humans that possess all these advantages became the most powerful and most important animals on Earth. But the surprising and important fact is that humans enjoyed all these advantages, big brains, tools, uh, uh, complex societies, for mo more than two million years. And during these years, they remained weak and marginal creatures, without much impact on the environment. Counting all humans together all over the world, from Indonesia to, to Britain, there were less than one million humans, uh, about, say, a million years ago. And they, did, they were not the top predators of the ecosystem. They were not top dogs. Actually, they were preyed upon. They were hunted by uh, bigger animals, such as uh, lions and bears and alligators. Humans themselves were not very uh, good hunters. They were rarely able to hunt by themselves big animals like giraffes or elephants. Most humans subsisted by eating uh, vegetable, uh, uh, vegetable foods like uh, nuts and fruits and uh, uh, mushrooms and things like that, by hunting small animals like uh, rabbits and frogs and turtles, and also by eating the leftovers of other animals. Like a lion would come and uh, 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 hunt a giraffe, and humans will come later on as scavengers and eat whatever is left. One of the most common uses of early stone tools was actually not to hunt uh, animals, but to crack open the bones of dead animals in order to get uh, the marrow. The marrow is the, the black stuff inside, uh, inside bones. So this is one of the things that ancient humans probably ate. Actually, some researchers believe that eating marrow was the original niche, the original speciality of humans in the world. Every animal, I mean, many animals have a, a special niche in nature. For example, woodpeckers, uh, this is a kind of, of bird which has a, a, a strong and sophisticated beak which enables woodpeckers to peck inside wood, to uh, uh, make holes in tree trunks and pull out all kinds of termites and worms and insects that live inside the wood and eat them. And this is the niche, this is the speciality of woodpeckers. So just as woodpeckers had this speciality, Ancient humans had their speciality in nature, which was to eat marrow, to eat the marrow inside bones. Why marrow? Well, imagine that you're a human a million years ago, and you see a lion take down a big giraffe. Now, this is very tempting to try and, and, and eat something from the uh, a giraffe steak, but you don't want to go anywhere near a hungry lion because he may eat you as well as the giraffe. So you stay away. You hide and you watch the lion eating the, the giraffe, but you stay away. And eventually the lion had his fill and goes away. And it's, it's a big giraffe. There was still something to eat. But you don't dare to approach the giraffe yourself because now is the time of the bigger uh, scavengers like the hyenas and the wolves. Now it's, it's their turn. You don't want to mess with the hyenas. So the hyenas come and eat whatever is the lion has left, and you and your friends, you still stay away, uh, hiding and watching carefully. Eventually, the hyenas go, go away, and the jackals and the wolves, they all go away. And only then, you and your friends uh, approach the carcass of the giraffe, looking left and right all the time very frightfully, maybe a lion or a hyena is coming. And when you see that nobody is coming, you approach what remains of the giraffe, and you usually find out that there is nothing left to eat, because the lion and the hyenas and the wolves, they just finished everything. The only thing that is still left to eat from this giraffe is the mirror inside the bones, because in, in big bones, neither lions, nor hyenas, nor jackals, they don't have the force in their jaws and in their teeth 
to break open uh, large bones and eat the marrow inside. And now it's your turn, humans. You and your friends, you come, you pick up one of these big giraffe bones and you take out your big invention, the, 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 the flint knife, and you take the bone and you cut it open and you break it open and you eat the marrow. And this is your special, this is what humans are famous for in the savannah a million years ago, they can break open the bones and eat the marrow. So these are humans a million years ago. And it is a key to understanding our history and our psychology, even today, to realize that the position of humans in the food chain for close to two million years was somewhere in the middle we were not top predators. We were somewhere in the middle of the food chain for hundreds of thousands of years. Yes, our ancestors hunted uh, small animals like these turtles and birds and, and whatever, but all the time they were being hunted by the large predators and they were usually unable uh, uh, to hunt big animals by themselves. Only about 400,000 years ago, several species of humans, like Neanderthals, began to hunt large animals on a regular basis. And only in the last 100,000 years, with the rise of our species Homo sapiens, only then, in the last 100,000 years, did humans jump from the middle to the top of the food chain and became top predators of planet Earth. This spectacular leap from the middle to the top of the food chain had enormous consequences. Uh, not only in what uh, people could, could eat and do, but also psychologically and socially. Humans were not used to being at the summit of the food chain, and they were actually ill-adapted for, for this position. Other animals that, uh, that uh, are at the top of the food pyramid like lions and sharks and alligators and bears, they evolved to fill this position of, of, of top predators over millions of years. So they're used to it. They know what to do with it. Humankind, on the other hand, ascended to the position of top predator of the planet almost overnight. In evolutionary terms, it took us almost no time to jump from the middle to the top of the food chain and it was not enough time for uh, humans to adapt themselves to this uh, uh, new position. Many historical calamities, many things about the way that humans behave towards others and toward the environment, from the deadly wars between humans to the ways that people treat the ecosystem around them, many of these things result from this over-hasty jump that we now feel a position in the ecosystem which is completely different from the position of our ancestors until a very short time ago, and we are not, just not used to it and not well adapted to it. Sometimes we think about ourselves, humankind, as a pack of wolves that somehow got hold of tanks and atom bombs. This is wrong. It is better to think about ourselves as a herd of sheep who due to some evolutionary accident learned how to make and use tanks and atom bombs. And armed sheep are far more dangerous than armed wolves because they are not used to it and they don't know what to do, how to behave in, 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 in a position of power. Wolves know what, what to do with power. Sh uh, sheep and humans know far less what to do with power. How exactly did we make this sudden jump? from the middle to the top of the food chain. We will begin exploring this question in the next segment of this lesson.